Chris, are you there, my friend? Oh, I'm here, my friend. Perfect. <laughs> are you on the beach, Chris? <laughs> well, I, I can hear the beach. First ever 4 a.m. lecture, that's for no, sure. That so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> this is criminal. But we have wine, and you probably have only water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should um, we should begin uh, just because I know it's been a long sort of conversation about architectural pedagogy as well as research and virtualizing education. Um, how the third session is going to run? Yes, that's all right. Um, how the third session is going to run is I will introduce both Justina. Uh, she will give a talk, and then I will introduce Chris Pierce, uh, and then he'll give a talk, and then we'll facilitate. Uh, a conversation uh, about this whole idea actually today about globalizing architecture education. So without further ado, I will introduce Justina. So Justina is a professor in architecture and urban design at the Melbourne School of Design. She researches urban design and architecture through practice and design globally by publication. She has achieved numerous design awards and has an extensive record of fantastic exhibitions. Her work in sustainability was recognized by Reba in 2008 for her housing design awards and the historic awards for the Spinney Garden. Her book promoting sustainable living, sustainability as an object of desire and making of Hong Kong from vertical to volumetric extends her thought leadership in both sustainability and education. She recently co-edited Urban Galapagos, which considers the opportunities in natural urban systems, engaging computer, social, and economic sciences with design in the 21st century. So without further ado, I'll hand the mouse over to Justina and let her present. It's great to be here at this global forum. When I first arrived in Australia in 2008, I was um, a little bit concerned about being so isolated. As Donald said, I felt like I'm at the end of the world. Therefore, I basically changed the kind of usual way we look at the map of the world and look at for this kind of a point of view, because then Australia becomes like in the middle of the world, not on the edge which I much prefer this kind of vision. And in here I mark, unfortunately, I think it doesn't show all the studios that we have. Um, all the studios where our students recently were able to participate in. So it actually makes us not that isolated. It makes us much more global, since this is Global Forum. Personally, I'll now talk about two of my research projects, volumetric cities and complex adaptive system and couple urban and natural system. Volumetric city was the research project I brought with me from Hong Kong. And my interest in volumetric cities in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is very volumetric. But um, when I arrived in Melbourne, the city was rather flat. But fortunately, my second studio was able to take students to Genoa. And Genoa is one of the probably worst, best volumetric cities. Following that, you cannot see it because it's kind of covered. We took our students a few times to Hong Kong. Um, and we work there with people from uh, University Catolica of Santiago de Chile and also University of Nanjing. We also took students to um, Shenzhen, where they work on volumetric city with us. Um, the biggest kind of break for me in volumetric city was through AA, when uh, one of our graduates from AA, Cristiano Ciccato, came to Hong Kong and introduce us to digital project, part of the CATIA software. I did not use the computer. I was kind of reluctant to use computer at that, at, to that point. The moment I discovered CATIA and digital project, my attitude to computers changed completely because for the first time, I didn't have to do plan section elevation. I could start with a point in space. And that was totally amazing. 
As a result, we ended up with exhibiting in Venice Biennale 2010, and a few years later, we took a group of the students to Shenzhen Biennale, where they part of the exhibition, and 25 students work on just one volumetric section. And obviously, when you do research, you do publication. So this is one of them. Next project is uh, Complex Adaptive System. Again, in 2008, I was very lucky to be sent to South America for recruitment to our faculty, to our university. We visited uh, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. We very quickly realized that people who were doing research in uh, um, Chile and people in Los Andes University in Bogota were probably people that we really wanted to develop kind of closer research and some kind of closer collaboration. So when they invited us for a workshop and asked us to bring our students to Cartagena, we jump and we organize a study abroad program to Cartagena. And in here, we basically were facing problem with climate change. Climate change was common problem around the world. Solution to the problem and the approaches to the problem are always very, very local. And in here, similar, maybe not as drastic as Venice, Venice, but every time it rains, the city floods. And that flooding, it happens because of our design intervention. This is where we work. Our students work with another, about more than 100 other students in the museum and this is how the museum looks like before we arrive situation changes dramatically when students are there the whole services around the museum changes so complex adaptive system are very easy to observe students work in a big room divided in group each group has students as you can see from the flag each group has students from all different countries, so never two students of, from the same country in one group. And we obviously celebrate the endings and having a lot of good parties. And we obviously publish books as we should. So in Cartagena, I met somebody from University of Trans San Francisco de Quito. So on my next uh, kind of recruitment trip to um, South America, I made sure that I stop in Ecuador and I go to the university. And just after my lecture about how wonderful our faculty was, I was asked to whether our students will be interested in participating in research project and in basically workshops every year in Galapagos. So who would say no? So from 2013 until COVID, we've been taking students every year for more than for, for months to Galapagos Island, working on research. Mainly our research concentrate on Santa Cruz Island and San Cristobal Island, but we encourage students to visit all the island around. We work in very close relationship with Charles Darwin uh, research, uh, research uh, Station and also Galapagos Science Center on San Cristobal Island. Over there, everybody is really interested in complex adaptive system. And we work with scientists from sociology, geography, biology, marine biology, all the different fields and discipline of knowledge. In here, they created a very interesting diagram about development of Galapagos, tracing at trigger points that actually change Galapagos from one system to another. And in 1998, they realized that basically some change needs to happen. Well, COVID happened. So what will happen next, we'll see. Um, as our studio, we decided to look at cycle of adaptive change, but in three different scale, environment, urban structure, and neosphere, processes that happen in our brain that dictates our environmental awareness and also our set of values that we carry. 
So we suggested that we put some kind of intervention, small intervention, small disruption within the urban structure and see what this urban structure will, what kind of results they will have on neosphere and environment. This is something wrong with this slide. Um, so we started with very simple modeling and modeling only related to uh, urban structure. And then working with scientists, we start modeling also things like water demands and how the environment could improve and change. Looking at couple urban and natural system in Galapagos is rather easy because it's all over there. Animals skew for fish, exactly like human. And gathering data is incredibly easy. We could also learn a lot from kind of way that sea lions relax on the beach. The boundary in between uh, urban form and natural system are incredibly precisely defined. There is no kind of anybody would dare to step over that barrier very much like medieval city walls. But here, the walls is basically lined on land. Architecture is very often questionable. The material use are all imported from mainland, and this is uh, concrete blocks. But innovation happens everywhere. Pizza oven is taken outside the building, promoting, kind of protecting tables. And yes, encroaching on pedestrian but why not? If you have anything to sell, or if you have any services to offer, like photocopying, you put a table outside your window and serve the public. Any niches or any gaps in the urban structure is always turned into some kind of business. So there's a lot of to observe, and this is why our students work. We also work in convention center, where students easily adapt to any kind of way of working. And, and on the beach, and in hotel lobbies. Obviously, we eat a lot. And as you can see, we always really happy in Galapagos. Now, there are huge problems in Galapagos. One is, is with the plastic. It, uh, although Galapagos decided to have, get rid of plastic on the island uh, by 20 to 2030s, but Unfortunately, most of the plastic is deposited by the uh, sea currents. So, creates big hazard for the animals. So working with researcher again from the institute and introducing that research to children, we could introduce them and create another value in the rubbish, basically teaching them what they can do with recycled plastic from the beaches when you put pulverizer and 3D printer in the school. If the plastic is not allowed on the island, the amount of deposited uh, plastic on the beaches will be able to create all the toys that they want. Also, they can teach the parents how they can recycle plastic from the beach for, utilis uh, for things like plates, bottles, etc. So import from the mainland will decrease. The other problem is, one of the other problem is invasive trees like guava trees, which is hardwood, very good for construction. And yes, it could replace all the concrete that is imported and concrete blocks as well. Now, these are probably not the best architecture you have seen, but in here was basically to suggest to the public and residents that anything is possible if you use gua guava trees, any shapes. You can use guava tree for furniture and other things. So, huge amount of work has been done and most of the projects are mentioned here in another publication. Well, when COVID struck, we couldn't take students anywhere. So we started again talking to people at the University of Los Andes saying, could we have a studio probably, probably online together to make students a little bit of aware what's happening in the other part of the world? Well, that kind of conversation led to involvement on 10 schools spread over nine countries, 
five continents and nine different time zones. So we work basically non-stop for three weeks, sleeping only occasionally and driving our partners completely mad. These are all the schools involved in the project. Each school came with a different trigger for the students. All about all the work was about COVID, how different countries reacted to COVID. And when we talk, started talking to people in Venezuela, they said, COVID? COVID is the least of our problems. We have real problems, not COVID. Out of that came publication that is ready to be published. We're now searching for publishers that can do it cheaply. And this is basically the work from different schools, which is about nearly 300 pages. Some of them is actually quite interesting. Um, but I'm just flipping through because I'm very much aware of the time. So we're waiting for possible publisher, and we're also looking for collaborators in our next project, which or research project, which is hope in perturbanism per per or perturbation. Thank you very much. Hold on, Justina, you have to realize that Justina actually just got her vaccination shot today. So she actually powered through this, this talk after feeling a little bit dizzy. So I have to say that that was very well done, Justina. Well, that's a good excuse for the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. No, it was great. All right. So without further ado, I will uh, introduce Chris Pierce. So Chris Pierce is an academic leader, educator, writer, curator, designer, director of creative agencies and creative advisor in global networks. Chris, what don't you do? Yeah, <laughs> a bundle of energy. Chris has more than 25 years of higher educational teaching, research and leadership experience in both the private and public sector. He was a key, he was a key member to lead the AA successful application for degree awarding powers. And for the last 14 years, Chris has been an integral part of the unit master system and has led AA visiting school to what it is today, which is an integral global network of a part-time architectural course that tests challenges and proposes new experimental and provocative ideas. Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I'm assuming that you'll be presenting something about the AA visiting school. I, I am, that's absolutely right. Well, that's precisely what I'm doing. I'm a six ideas for a visiting school. Perfect. Super. Uh, Justina, you started with a, a new map. So I thought I quickly rejigged my presentation to start with a, a, a new flag. So we've got a new map and a new flag, which I thought was absolutely fabulous way of presenting this, this uh, session. This is a flag we devised about four or five years ago for the AA Visiting School. And I'm just going to talk briefly about the Visiting School as a form of global architectural education. Um, so there's our new flag. This, you all will know, as that static set of very old buildings in London that we call the home of the Architectural Association. Um, about 12 years ago now, Brett Steele and I sat down and brainstormed how we could get out of these buildings and spend some time, importantly, around the world, learning from the world, not expecting the world to come to us. So we devised this, the AA Visiting School, to put ourselves in extraordinarily different locations, different places around the world, and experiment locally, not expecting everything to happen in the center of London. Um, we also didn't want to go out like this. So we found other references than the conventional Taurus, and we kind of looked to Charlotte Parriad and Carlo Molino, who uh, obviously the Alps was extraordinarily important to their work, and they became more of a kind of influence for us in how to construct a global form of architectural education. So we started in Dubai, and this talk is gonna talk about six ideas for an AA visiting school. Visiting school, the VS being important because we thought, all right, visiting school, it's got to be very strange. So part of our uh, kind of remit to everyone who works with us is to really explore and experiment. There's absolutely no regulatory body overseeing the visiting school other than the AA itself as a center for experimentation. So in that respect, we can pretty much push the boundaries just as far as we want. And that's what we look to do in the visiting school. 
However, you all, it was really interesting because when I sat down to, to put this presentation together, which I've given before in different forms, I thought how relevant it is to the situation we find ourselves in today. First of all, idea one, this is not something that Brett or I cooked up uh, yesterday. This is something we've had around and been thinking about for 12 years. Schools are already invisible, now more than ever, but certainly this picture of Usica uh, definitely attests to the fact that schools don't have to be physical places. Um, they are already invisible. Uh, we kind of aligned the visiting school to the airport and air travel, something that we're not doing that much of, but that kind of movement and that, uh, that, that shifting of place very, very rapidly. The second, which, let me just see if this little video will play. Second idea was the world is a campus for learning. And I think, Justina, you said something really important. I scribbled it down. Solutions are local. And I really want to emphasize that. When we go out into all of these places, it's about learning uh, and it's about devising, creating, and experimenting um, local solutions that are actually transferable to global issues. And I think that's one of the real, real values of working in particular places all over the world. Um, this idea obviously isn't new. This is a map of Celtic monasteries across Europe uh, in the medieval period. So the idea of travel and learning by travel and learning by kind of accumulating knowledge over different places is obviously not new at all. So it's a kind of adaptation of an idea. Uh, a huge reference has also been for us Cedric Price. Um, Cedric Price and the Polyarch Project taking students in a reformed bus to learn through driving around England, um, sometimes driving unsuccessfully around, around England, but at the same time, learning by being out in the world and doing, not within these Georgian buildings in Bedford Square. And I think Cedric always had an antagonistic relationship with them, and I would say that I probably do as well. And hence the kind of desire to get out in the world and learn from it and bring some of that information back to Bedford Square. So this is what a kind of visiting school looks like roughly today with these spots all over the world. They are, as Mont has said, they are short courses. They are learning from particular places. But at the same time, we're also moving towards trying to network these different places around particular themes to build a global master's degree. And this is a global master's degree that would focus on themes and topics and different approaches to them in different places in the world. So for example, on the map there, you can see Los Angeles, Granada, and Chengdu. Housing is an issue in all of those places, but it's approached very, very differently in those places. And we would look at how those different places approach the subject of housing as a form of a global master's degree on housing. This is a little bit how the visiting school breaks down. We typically have about a thousand or more students a year in different places, kind of breaks down 50% international, 50% local and regional, but it also shows about the 86 countries that participate in the program and that are a part of this kind of, I mean, honestly, just a kind of experiment in architectural education. Um, Idea three, which we didn't want to forget in the formulation of this, is that you don't always have to go far. Sometimes the most exotic locations are the one closest to home. And that's absolutely in the case of the Architectural Association in Bedford Square, which we also see as a part of this global education network. And let me show you a little film of Emmanuel Veracruz's program down in Hook Park called Robotic Fabrications. So in the middle of the forest, what Emmanuel did for a number of years was literally customize chainsaws. So that the chainsaw was customized, uh, was, was uh, attached to a robot and then used to construct a building on site in Hook Park. So a really kind of interesting way of working with forestry wood, but doing that close to home in Hook Park, which is a property of the Architectural Association. Um, idea four, don't forget, I've only got six, so this isn't gonna go on forever. Um, schools are more like airports than destinations, a kind of vintage shot of inside Heathrow Airport. But I thought how incredibly akin it was to inside of the entrance hall to the AA. So that again, institutions are not destinations. They're places that we pass through, learn from, contribute to, but are not these static entities, which they've so often been uh, kind of approached as being. 
Uh, idea five, and this is uh, this is an important one, kind of kind of an important one, but also one to question in today's circumstances, is that the modern architect has always been a pilot. Uh, here, Le Corbusier, obviously the whole idea of the aerial view. Um, Eileen Gray and her fabulous kind of airplane uh, light fixture. Uh, Norman Foster, uh, absolute fascination with flying and getting around. There's, of course, the pilots of the automobile, uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, and the ultimate pilot, Zaha Hadid. So the idea of piloting travel, viewing the world from different perspectives is innate to the architect and something that we really wanted to embody within the AA visiting school. And finally, the last idea was just that mobility invents audiences, not only architects. And this is a really, really important part of this project. It's about the audience, the people that we collaborate with, the people that become a part of the conversation in the visiting school. And that extends all across the globe. This is a, a shot of a project that we did in Africa. This is Ross Lovegrove out in the desert, the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan. So again, it's putting ourselves in places which in some ways are sometimes uncomfortable, but it really is finding audiences, whether the animals, uh, Ross was insistent of giving a lecture in the desert and he didn't really care about the people, but he cared about the animals and all the place around him. So it is talking not only to people, but to animals and places. Um, and finally, we're kind of be becoming kind of a little interested in interplanetary. So um, the visiting school, while it's been obsessed by Earth for a while, is kind of beginning to find its interest on the moon or in Kais's case in Mars, uh, which we've been looking at recently. So extending the idea of the terra firma and where we work. And uh, yeah, that's right. Our vantage point looking, looking beyond our planet and thinking of ideas and trying to ferment and create ideas uh, in different places around the globe. That is the AA Visiting School mod. I hope that didn't take too long. So um, if any of you who want to sort of post questions, do it in the Q&A section uh, on Zoom and I'll get to it as well. Uh, I just wanted to say that was an amazing presentation, Chris, and I said that it was more like a holiday brochure destination for, for, the, last, uh, <laughs> for the last year and a half that we haven't been away. Um, and I think we're raring to get, get away, especially in Australia over here. I think one of the questions that I've always been thinking about, about this global sort of architectural education was that um, at my time at the AA, I was there and as you know, Chris, our class was filled with people from Korea, Belarus, like Denmark, Australia. And I felt like you learned just as much about the place from people as you do the place. And one of the things that are starting to emerge these days is that skill sharing, such as like YouTube, educational platforms, such as masterclasses and Skillshare, they're really taking the technicalities of what institutions and schools used to do. So I think one of my questions would be like, you know, what is the relevance of an institution now that, you know, people are taking away, you know, that's like technical skill set and people can join communities online. Is it about the registration? Is it about the structure? I think that's more of an open conversation between, you know, Justina and yourself that I'd like to maybe start with. You want to start with me, Mon? Sure. I, yes, I, yeah, yes, go yes. for it. Yes. <laughs> Justina. <laughs> Justina, hopefully I just opened the conversation a little bit. All right. Uh, uh, Mon, I kind of, be, because happily Mon sent us these questions in advance. So being 5 a.m., I had a chance to think about them and scribble a few ideas. So I made some sense, hopefully. Um, Mon, I, I think it's Justina, I'm quite keen to hear what you say. Uh, for me, it's very much, uh, places are about bringing together expertise. And Mon, honestly, there's nothing like going somewhere, and I still do it with my unit at the AA every single year, going to a place and gaining expertise that however much online activity there is, there, however much knowledge is shared across other platforms, there really is, I've found nothing like learning from people in a place. And interestingly, this year, where our hope had been with the unit to travel all the way from London through to Istanbul, our intent was to stop at schools of architecture on the way. But the reason that we wanted to do that was to understand the place through the local expertise, particularly not through the web, not through virtual platforms or anything else, but to learn from the expertise on the ground who could take us to the places there that were significant. So for me, 
organizations, institutions and everything are really important as what I kind of bringing together expertise and bringing together local expertise, but also bringing together people who come from afar to learn about a particular place. So for me, places and institutions are really, really important as kind of centers of expertise. And also, I guess the filtering of information, right? Because there's so much out there. What do you actually choose now? I think it's like the reversal of what there used to be. It used to be, you know, education and information used to be held up in institutions, whereas now there's so much information. What is the relevant one that we should be looking at rather than the ones that isn't? Nicely said. I would like for a moment to basically compare AA and Melbourne. When I was at AA, first as a student and then as a teacher, I could not imagine a better life. To me, it was, AA was a magical place. And yes, you learn things not only in a studio, but by kind of osmosis in a bar and in the surrounding area, you were so close to other institutions. You were very close to REB library. You were close to all the different lectures. And then I went, to Hong Kong for a while, to the university, and then I ended up in Melbourne. And what was really staggering for me to be in Melbourne was the proximity of the university and different faculties. And being able to actually meet people from different disciplines, because suddenly the completely different point of view at looking at something. And I thought, how could I actually consider myself architect really without knowing knowing all that knowledge thing like computer modeling okay i started it very late in my life and it didn't come easy i mean the older you are the more difficult it is to learn it, it does not come naturally like for my children but working with computer scientists suddenly it was totally amazing. It takes them seconds to do something that I have to take like weeks of suffering and it's blood on paper. For them, it's like a pleasure. So then people that deal with material science, uh, people, biologists, environmentalists, all these kind of amazing knowledge that is in this institution is great. Then when you take students away from it, and go to another institution, your network basically starts spreading. So yes, I do believe AA is still the best school of architecture. I've got to be very quiet. As you can hear, <laughs> I'm saying it a little bit on slower voice, like the lower voice. But being at university, it has tremendous advantages, mm. especially for architects. So somewhere, you know, the combination of AA and Melbourne School of Design are probably is the best combination. That's my selling pitch. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I guess one of the other questions that I, I want to raise is that, you know, architecture in the past used to be quite a vernacular approach and institutions themselves were always based like Melbourne University, Sydney University. So you'd learn things in that place. But then because the development of travel and this whole idea of globalization, we always see this almost colonialization as well. Like, you know, people bringing different ideas to different areas and saying what is what. I think, you know, how do we navigate this space properly and how do we do it sensitively? Because we can always go to these places and romanticize these places as well. So when I was a student as well, I went to Chernobyl, I went to Kazakhstan, I went to Alaska during winter solstice. And one of the things that I realized was that I learned more about myself and the amazing cities that I've been to because I could compare them. I was able to compare these things and also break my preconceptions of what, you know, building is or what people do or how, you know, to live a sort of, you know, satisfied or fulfilled life. And I guess now as we're sort of going into this globalization of, you know, education, but also architecture, you know, looking forwards, the question I would ask both of you is, well, how should we navigate this space and what would you tell future students? Well. 
And I know it's late and it's Chris, Chris, would you like to start? Oh, it's not late Mon, it's not late at all. It's five twenty-four AM. I'm ready to go, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm just starting up now. Uh, no, listen, well, you bring up you you bring up a massively important question. I mean, hugely important, and one that uh, uh, listen, I'm both comfortable with and uncomfortable with, and that is that the visiting school when we started it, I think began way too much as a colonial project. It became a project of kind of extending so-called expertise into places and being a little bit impositional about that. And, and I think that's, a, that's a, 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 something I learned from very, very quickly was not the right approach and the right way to go about things. And actually, I mean, I would say the project that one of the projects that we have right now is a program in Khartoum in Sudan. And that project, I think, which we're just getting off the ground now, is interesting to me on account of the fact that the people who are running that program are based there. And I think that's something we've really shift, shifted in the visiting school. The visiting schools typically were a group of people going to a place and, and typically external to the place. The way that we've turned the visiting school 180 degrees on its head is by working with much more approaches to contemporary issues in particular places with the people running those programs being the heads of the program and being on the ground and being from the place and of the place. And I think the mix of nationalities, the mix of people coming is spectacular. But I think what we've really tried to do is shift away from a colonial model, which is very easy to do, to talk about it, shipping a load of people to a place and learning from somewhere. We're trying to work kind of from the inside out now and use local expertise and local intelligence and creativity as a way of starting an exchange and a dialogue between people coming from that place, but also people coming from abroad. But a one that I'm really sensitive to because it was something that could easily have been leveled at the visiting school five years ago, 10 years ago even, that we were just about colonizing places and imposing ourselves. And I think that's helped me to understand how to flip that model exactly 180 degrees and hopefully create pro programs that are more sustainable, but that genuinely give back to the profession at this point in time from really, really kind of different and critical perspectives. It's kind of interesting because our research project, for example, in Galapagos, we work with the people who are situating on site. The Science Institute exists there and have mm. researchers that work with community all the time. And each time we take the students, new bunch of students there for months, they carry on the work that has been done before. So it's a continuous kind of cycle all the data is deposited into the depository and all the knowledge also what is really fascinating that whatever we do even tiny things you can see its effects the following year mm -hmm. because islands are tiny and the effect on it on the environment <coughs> on the people's perception of what is important to them is visible <coughs> so it's slightly different than your um a workshop around the world because we keep going to the same place it does not um, answer the question however but it's interesting conversations and what could have equally interesting to your question because mm. because one of the main things that i i think that you know from the conversation that you guys have just had is that diversity and inclusion is something that has to happen for, for these types of programs to work well also you're bringing students always from different part of the world mm. and when students are mixed and seeing totally different perception mm. of the bunch that comes from us um, which are usually thinking that they know everything and they are experts mm. sorry donald and <laughs> I suddenly saw you and I thought, oh my God, uh, <laughs> nothing to do with basically, I'm saying that certain nationalities see the problems differently. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned, people from Venezuela saw the COVID as a tiny problem comparing with the problems that they had, et cetera, et cetera. So when you have people from different nationality coming, different part of the world with different culture 
coming to the same place and looking at the problem, they suddenly see all this different, sometimes uh, not uh, really the same ideas, which needs to be discussed and some kind of common grants have to be found. And the population on, I don't know, where this the same with a, a workshop, but I remember very vividly our first workshop in Galapagos when the mayor of Galapagos, uh, one of the islands, told us, we hate foreign experts coming here and telling us what to do. Mm. And I thought, wow, this is the best meeting I ever had <laughs> because it really shows you, you have no right to come somewhere and mm. tell them, we show you the right way. But, you know, you can change people's mentality slowly and gradually. And now the mayor is our best friend. Mm. Well, now he's not a mayor anymore, but he used to be our best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I like, uh, Justina, I like the fact you, uh, it's about asking questions. Yeah. Not, I, I mean, what we kind of learned, about asking questions, not making statements in a way. And by asking questions, you can learn so much and become part of it and really kind of become part of a place in a way. I think asking questions is one of the key approaches that we try to take through all the programs of the visiting school to inquiry through questioning as opposed to kind of trying to impose. And I think we did that very, very badly at first. And in learning about how to build, you know, it, the, if the theme of the session is global architectural education, it really is about how to build a global architectural education in 2021, not 1921. <laughs> I just have a question from one of the um, Zoom members, actually. Uh, she was saying that, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, do you think it is possible for students to connect with local problems without being physically situated in a place? Of course, travel is ideal, but where it's not possible, do you have advice about how to engage when you are not at the local premises? Okay, well, I, I'll, th I'll throw in really quick and then Justina, by all means, jump in. Listen, uh, this is something we're just experimenting with now. And I think one of the best outcomes of the pandemic for the visiting school, it's had us become a little bit more open-minded about how to develop programs and how to work. So we're actually, and I know Beatrice is here somewhere, and Beatrice has been instrumental in helping us think about how to build what we call hybrid programs. And that is hybrid programs where we do have a group of people working in a place, but those might be people that are all local to the place. But then working online with groups of students and professionals everywhere around the world and engaging in a dialogue in that form. Uh, we're not expert at it at all. In fact, we're, I mean, we're like, we're toddlers at it right now. But the idea is really, uh, Mon, that we build programs that are accessible, that don't require travel, that don't require a huge carbon footprint, that don't use insane amounts of natural resources and everything, but somehow are still relevant, are still, are still more than just a, a Zoom call let's say. And we're trying to experiment with different hybrid forms with groups of people on site and groups of people online. But we've yet, uh, uh, if I was to be honest, we've yet to do, do one where I've yet to see one that is really tremendously successful yet. And so I think it's an area we're experimenting in, but it's something that we're only just beginning to learn about. I find the question very interesting because yeah. The person asked how do we can get involved with something else, not by physically going there. Well, you can get involved anytime you want. Mm. Um, and you don't have to be physically there. It's mainly about maybe what you were saying before, asking the right question and how that involvement can, hap can happen. Because we take students not in order to show the population what could be done, but for students to learn something from being actually there. So they gather that local knowledge. Most of them come back from, if we take them, to, for example, to Galapagos, they all come back and they become environmentalists, which is a little bit scary in one way. And they stop caring that much about architecture, but they start very much caring about ethics. It's what we actually put in the world and what our design does 
to their environment. And that is kind of interesting because I start thinking after going back, backwards and from, forwards from the Galapagos for now quite a few years, I say, why don't we teach ethics? You know, doctors have their oaths. I'm not going to do any harm. Our profession doesn't have the same mm. principle. And I don't know about any school of architecture around the world that teach ethics. Sorry, this is completely going in the wrong direction now, but uh, that's basically the question that it kind of bothered me a little bit. Mm. Did, did, wasn't the old Melbourne model that when you graduated with a PhD was a doctor in philosophy? Well, sure, and mm. you still is, is PhD. Mm. Yes, so. But you're saying it's like actual, like. It is not the philosophy. I'm not mm. talking about the, I'm talking about simple ethics. Mm. What do you do by putting whatever we putting in the world? Mm. And yes, we're teaching students to put this uh, wonderful towers in Melbourne. You know, they all working in the offices. Um, anyway, I'll. Yeah, well, I will ask for next. I mean, I will wait for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Christina, I don't think that's a tangent, though. I don't think that's a tangent. I think you're absolutely right. It, 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 but more students come away asking qu uh, questions about ethics in certain cases than maybe about an architectural project. I think it's a very, very important point because I think that is absolutely what I've learned from all the places that we work around the globe. I mean, Mon, if you look back on it, your time in Chernobyl, your time in Alaska and everything else, you came back, I mean, ethics is a key part of it. And it is a key part of the education and certainly one that you get through a global architectural education. That's something that it's called like environmental education that you don't get by desktop research. So mm -hmm. I think there's this like advantage of desktop research that you can actually do a lot of, you know, um, high sort of you know opinions and learning through the internet as well as through your desktop but actually to prove things to actually validate things i think you'll just have to go to a place there's that sort of hybridity that we can that you know sometimes our friends are closer on facebook or reddit around the world rather than our next door neighbor and we can have those conversations but being quite critical of it and i think moving forwards is actually something that's very very important especially in this idea of globalization in architecture education um, but I think hey, that, before uh, you stop there, listen, you, you make me really happy, I'll tell you, because you're a young guy and you still see the value of going to a place. I worry that as I get older, because I'm an advocate always for going to places, but I'm terrified that I'm a dinosaur in that respect and I need to learn to travel through the computer well, and everything look else. Look at me, look at me, I'm much older <laughs> and I'm <laughs> eager to go. <laughs> exactly. So, Mon, great to hear that your generation is as well, because that's absolutely essential. I mean, I kind of base so much of what we do about being in different places, and I, I don't want that to be, uh, yeah, I don't want that to be lost. Hmm. Absolutely not. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm probably going to wrap up the session now, um, and what a, what a three sessions it has been. Um, I want to thank every single one of you um, online and offline for being here. I want to thank all the speakers from the first session, the second session, uh, all the guests and staff as well. Um, and all the, I guess, you know, filming crew uh, that's put all this together. You don't realize the actually advanced four screens that is going on behind the scenes. Um, and I also want to maybe bring up this slide again. Let me just share the screen. Let's see. Yeah, so I just want to say that um, to, continue, to continue this conversation, uh, we also have the AA Visiting School in Melbourne. Uh, that's going to be happening to the 5th to the 16th of July 2021. Uh, a lot of the speakers that you saw today will be involved in somewhat or some form, uh, being a tutor or a guest speaker. And we're going to try this hybrid model again in terms of half offline and half offline. And it's going to talk about the digital world. So this physical and digital hybrid of where I guess our society and even architecture is starting to happen. Um, and without further ado, is there any final uh, one more slide? Yeah. Yep. And um, I guess this is the first of many. Uh, as you know, Chris, this is the first uh, global forum that we've done. 
Mm. Uh, and we started at the kickoff in the future. So I guess in our time zone, we're ahead of everyone else. Uh, so I'm sure that the next ones uh, will be in Caribbean, uh, Berlin, yes. and Korea. And hopefully one day we'll be able to visit those places as well and be <laughs> part of that conversation. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I loved every minute of it. And uh, thank you all so much for attending. I always find that the end of one of these talks, it's always a uh, end sort of uh, talk and you don't have drinks. So hopefully one day we can have an informal conversation at the end and uh, chat. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.